Welcome. This is the first episode of Blind Ambition. My name is Jack Kelly. I'm the senior contributor of Forbes, CEO of the Compliance Search Group, and we recruiter, both uh, meant to help people find jobs. And today, I'm excited. This is fantastic. The first episode of Hopefully Many. And uh, Rick, maybe you could take it away. Sure. So I am Rick. I am the head of public relations at Blind, uh, the professional social network. Uh, nearly 6 million verified professionals talking about everything from career advice uh, to benefits to how to navigate the workplace. Uh, and, and that really is about what Blind Ambition is all about, really trying to understand what's going on at some of the top tech companies uh, and, and how we can succeed in the workplace. I have Flea, who is the chief security officer at Gusto. And Gusto is a people platform that serves more than 200,000 small businesses nationwide. Uh, it automates and simplifies payroll, employee benefits, and HR. And as the chief security officer, Flea is responsible for Gusto's information and physical security strategies, including consumer protection, compliance, governance, and risk. So thank you, Flea. It is a pleasure to be here, and it's also an honor to be one of the very first guests yes. of many on the Blind Ambition tour here. So, I, I mean, the, the first and the best. So we oh, know that yeah, already, right? Yeah, I, I mean, like that, that kind of came of with the name, right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, so speaking of the best, like, how does someone become a chief security officer? Can you walk us through your uh, career path, like? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, first, I just want to say there actually there's no one specific way to actually become a chief security officer. Um, and, you know, when it comes to me in particular, that isn't what I, you know, sought out to do, meaning like when I was a, you know, 12 year old, uh, you know, hacking and things like that, I wasn't thinking in my mind, oh, one day I'm going to be a chief security officer. Um, I, I think it's probably actually more useful, though, to talk about how I navigated my career. Right. And, and how I set myself up to eventually become a, a chief security officer and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things is also useful to actually just recognize is, like, as I said, like CISOs actually aren't cookie cutter. Um, and I, in particular, especially being here in Silicon Valley, uh, I am definitely not cookie cutter. Right. But like I, I, I don't look like what I think what a lot of people think of immediately when they think of a, you know, a Silicon Valley executive or, or that kind of thing. Right. Like. I show up like, look, you know, me dressing up as me wearing dickies, right? And, and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, when, when I think about the, you know, like how I began my career, it really was like actually focusing on the things that I was actually both passionate about and also good at, right? And then trying to find places that would amplify both of those things, right? So one of my very first jobs was at the Center of Analysis and Prediction of Storms. So scientific computing, right? Because like, I kind of like had this dream that I always wanted to be a builder and I wanted to actually focus on things that actually could allow me to actually, you know, reach new things, empower more people, use technology to fundamentally actually make life better. And so by helping predict like, you know, tornadoes and storms and things like that with scientific computing, I was, you know, trying to actually help make lives better and learning at the same time. Um, and then, you know, that whole like, you know, startup thing kind of started and I was like, oh, well, hey, this is actually a great opportunity to maybe even take things even further. And so like one of my very first jobs, believe it or not, was working at a handful of little startups in Oklahoma. And um, this was back in the 90s during the whole, you know, dot com boom, um, et cetera. Um, but along that way, I was like, essentially not just working at these jobs, but Intentionally and unintentionally, I was actually just building this tool set, right? Like, like almost like envision like preparing to be a carpenter or something along those lines. I was essentially like going through all these various apprenticeships. And as I was getting older and more mature, I started to become a little bit more focused about, hey, how do I continue to actually add more tools into my tool belt, right? Like, you know, how do I actually go out and actually find, you know, that perfect hammer? How do I actually go out and actually find and differentiate between, you know, like using a driver uh, versus just a normal, um, you know, drill and those kind of things. And so, you know, after, you know, my stint in Oklahoma, um, I decided that, hey, after doing some of the dot-com stuff, I recognized actually I didn't have any like big enterprise experience. Um, so I ended up taking a chance and joining Bank of America, which sounds almost antithetical to actually being like a Silicon Valley type person. 
but it was so empowering just from the standpoint of actually being actually go and see what things actually look like at scale. Um, and deal with technology at scale, but also the implications of technology at scale, which I later learned was actually a super important skill and something that I was actually kind of missing out on. And by having that perspective that I was actually picking up from Bank of America, that actually made me more attractive when I went back to startups, when I went back to startup land, because then it was like, hey, wait a second, now I have this additional skill that a lot of startups are actually missing. Like they didn't know what it meant to actually go through an enterprise sales cycle. They didn't know what it meant to actually have to deal with, you know, not just one data center, but global data centers and those kind of things. And so by working at Bank of America, I was arming myself with yet another tool. Um, as I got older, you know, like I said, uh, you know, going into Silicon Valley, I started to actually start refine how I wanted to use those tools. So my journey started shifting from tool collecting to, you know, continuing with the analogy, essentially like job site hunting, saying like, hey, where are my tools actually useful, right? Like, what are things I can actually do with, with these tools? So, you know, like one of the first like Silicon Valley companies that I, I was working at was this company called Fortify. We worked on static analysis, et cetera. It's actually something really, really specific in the security community. And I recognized like, hey, wait a second, I'm honing all of these skills around doing and building security for others, but I haven't actually been actually applying those skills towards actually building security programs and actually helping these companies actually really flourish with not only just buying a security product, but actually building and integrating security into their ecosystem. So, you know, shortly after Fortify, I joined this uh, UK company called Betfair, uh, which is all about, you know, essentially it was an, ex think of almost like a stock exchange, but for gambling. And there, it's like, it's really all about like, hey, helping them actually integrate security, making security actually part of the culture. And from there, I was actually was also picking up not just the skills about, hey, how to actually make security work in a company culture, but make security work across different cultures. Because Betfair was interesting because we had offices in Australia, we had offices in Romania, we had offices in the US, and all of those areas was actually forcing me to actually learn how to apply these tools to different areas and different parts of life. Um, and, you know, like as I was actually kind of like doing these things, obviously the rest of the ecosystem starts recognizing that and you actually see other people interested in that as well. And so, you know, I was, as I said, I was actually trying to actually refine my skill set, build more tools, figure out where I could best apply these tools. And then this interesting company called Twilio came knocking on the door. And at the time, um, I know this doesn't even seem like that long ago, but at the time, this whole cloud thing was like a new and emerging thing. It's like, hey, who are these people wanting to do stuff in, in, in Amazon. Amazon what? Amazon Web Services. I thought Amazon just, you know, shipped me toilet paper and comic books and that kind of stuff. Like, <laughs> well, no. Well, here's a chance to actually learn about this thing about the cloud, do something different. And once again, kind of make that, make that return to super early, you know, startup life. Like, like you're thinking like, you know, 100 employees, super scrappy, those kind of things. Um, and, and that was actually really, really useful because once again, it got me an opportunity to build my skill set, but it also gave me more opportunity to actually start refining uh, my what I actually bring to the job and who I actually am as a person and how I want to operate in the ecosystem. And, and you know, one of the interesting things about a lot of these companies and the, and the thread that I was eventually realizing the own pattern that I was having was that, oh, I'm really attracted to people and companies that are focused on essentially democratizing access, right? So when you think about Bank of America, as silly as that is, one of Bank of America's big things is that, oh, Bank of America had retail banks everywhere. They actually were one of the very first banks that actually gave loans to minorities and things like that. For, for those who actually aren't familiar, definitely go check out the history of Bank of America. It's really fascinating. Um, when you think about Fortify, yet again, it's like, hey, how can we actually democratize giving software security to the entire world? When you think about Betfair, it's all about, hey, making an even playing field for people that wanted to do sports gambling. When you think about Twilio, it's all about democratizing the access of communications, et cetera. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, like after Twilio, I went to a couple other places, including, you know, Square. And once again, there, the mission was all about kind of like that equality of access and actually broadening that. And then finally, like here at Gusto, where that theme is super strong, about this entire idea of actually getting and gaining access. And part of the reason why actually I talk about that pattern is that that pattern helped me also figure out what jobs are going to be right for me and which ones that I know that not only are I going to do a good job at, um, but also is actually going to be aligned with my personal values and my personal working style. So that's a little bit about my journey, about how I got to be a CISA. Um, 
and, and obviously some of that just has to do with just like time in the trenches. Um, some of it has to do with taking chances both on myself, on others that I would actually hire, and then also on companies. Uh, you know, at the time, uh, Twilio didn't seem like, hey, that seems like kind of like silly idea. It's like, hey, you're going to have SMS and yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, at the time that Gusto was created, like the idea of actually putting and having your payroll and all those other kind of things online seems somewhat, you know, risky and those kind of things. But by taking and placing those bets on great companies, placing those bets on me, which I, I consider myself a somewhat decent person, and then placing those bets on great people, um, that's fundamentally how I, you know, really realized this, this path of actually becoming a CISO. It's, it's so interesting, Flea, because a lot of times I see that people have a goal. Hey, I want to do X, and they go linear, which, which struck me, and I'm, Rick, I'm not sure how you feel about it too. It, it almost seemed like you were just feeling your way around from one opportunity to the other, and then each one kind of learning from it, crystallizing, building upon it, going into the next one, and so on, which is kind of a, a unique career path, right? Isn't that a it, little it, different it, than the it, usual, it's no? It's somewhat unique, but it is, right? inherent, it, it is inherently engineering related, right? Because essentially I was yeah. experimenting and refining, right? And, and, wait, wait, and wait, we, so, so, so the way, I, I want to process that for a second. So, so, so the way you're doing it is, like you say, it, it, it is actually kind of very thoughtful engineering you know, trying it, refining it. Does this work? Yeah. Going to okay. Yeah, and 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 learning along the way, right? Yeah. When you think about actually what makes you know us good engineers, especially you know like the kind of people that you know we hire at Gusto. That's actually what we literally look for. We look for actually people that one, and and it sounds really weird to actually say this because I'm actually talking yeah. about myself. Like one, yeah. hey, having that humility to actually be open to learning, um, having that idea of like saying like, hey, I want to be a part of a journey. Um, and, and I think that's really, you know, at least when I look at my career in hindsight, kind of like you said, path I was on. Um, and even if you actually, if you were to actually follow like my LinkedIn profile, it actually looks almost like a sine wave, right? But, but it's a sine wave that's actually gradually going up and to the right, um, meaning that I was actually taking some chances and also taking some, some sure bets and kind of like, you know, measuring those out um, with this fundamental, just crisp vision of what I really wanted to do. Um, like, that vision always gets refined. And, and that's actually one of the things we always think about here in startup land is like, yeah, that first thing that you might do, that may not be the thing that's going to be the stickiest thing, but you're going to learn from that. You're going to refine it. And then you're going to take those lessons onto the very next project or the next iteration of the thing that you're working on. So my career has just been me iterating, right? And iterating on my MVP, right? So like, you know, I got this this degree, I did all this other kind of stuff. I was like a little baby hacker back in the day. And I was just iterating on that. So I iterate, I iterated on like 12 year old hacker flea and started actually just constantly churning out, adding essentially more features, right? It's like, oh, well, hey, okay, well, well flea knows something about breaking into systems and those kind of things. Okay, well, well, can flea add another feature about learning how to protect systems? Can flea add another feature about learning how to incorporate security into a company? Oh, can flea add another feature about being able to actually mentor and help other, you know, security practitioners can flee at a feature about having business acumen to apply security more broadly, et cetera. So at least in my mind, it's like classic stereotypical kind of engineering behavior and very much at the heart of what I think makes a startup great and makes a company like Gusto great and kind of people that we try to hire are those people that are actually kind of willing to learn, willing to also make mistakes and, and, and you know, like, and, and to learn from those mistakes, make improvements upon that. And also that still kind of like have that grit and determination to keep pushing through, even through adversity and also even through prosperity. Cause that's one of those things that, you know, you have to kind of stay motivated even when things are going great. I think that's very brave to do as well, because it seems like, you know, by moving, you're taking a lot of risks and chances. Along the way, did you ever go to one place? And if you don't want to name it, that's cool. But you felt like, gosh, maybe this wasn't the best move or each one you made the best of it and learned from. Um, I feel like each one I made the best move and learned yeah. from. And, and, and one of the things I try to do, you know, before I even take a, an offer or switch jobs or think about other companies is I try to actually do some calcu calculations. Like, hey, well, what is it? How am I going to grow from this, right? Like, what about this company is going to make me better? Uh, you know, obviously everybody wants to care about financial prosperity and things like that. I think more about uh, personal prosperity, which is much broader than finances. 
Um, and, and that means like, hey, how do I continue growing? And, and that's one of the things that actually got me really excited about Gusto was literally the fact that that was an explicit value of the company is this whole idea of having a growth mindset and, and growth mentality. Um, and so like every single company, even the ones that seem weird and non-traditional, like think about this, like I, I'm, I'm like this crazy hacker from middle of nowhere, Mississippi. <laughs> And now all of a sudden I'm at Bank of America, right? Like I'm, I'm rubbing elbows with people in like three piece suits and crazy cars and people that like, I know nothing about golf. People that go golfing all the time. Did you, did like, you try to learn to play golf or no? No, 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 no. no. I, I gotta, I, you know. I, I don't I play stay, either. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, I gotta stay true to my hacker roots, but yeah. no, but, but it's, it's all about, you know, trying to always understand what you can actually help a company with and also how a company can help you grow. Um, and, and I think it's one of those things that sometimes we forget about, especially here in Silicon Valley, like how do I continue growing, right? Um, at some point, you're going to have all the material things you want or whatever, um, but you still need to actually continue that human journey of improvement. And, and that, that's really, at least in my opinion, what being human is about. It's about being better than you were last week and learning from mistakes, embracing mistakes and embracing risk-taking to some extent. So you can constantly be improving for yourself and also for your community and others. I love it. Well, what do you think? That, that's amazing. I, I love the story. In fact, if you don't mind, that, that, not, not to go on a tangent, I, I'm glad we're recording this. I, I love to write about this for Forbes. I love that arc because yeah. I, you're taking it for granted, right? You're taking what you do for granted. I'm hearing, I, Rick, I'm curious about your opinion. I, I think the way you go about your career is, is, is very different than most practitioners, career advisors, your parents and others would tell you to navigate it. And you've been super successful finding your own way and, and enjoying it and enjoying the ride, right, Rick? I mean, I, I mean, that's the one thing that I'm particularly struck by. You know, I, I've known Flea for a few years now and I, I, I'd love some tactical advice. You know, having this growth mindset and using your tools analogy, how do you evaluate when you have enough tools or uh, there are maybe no more tools at your current opportunity to collect? Uh, what does that look like? Yeah, you know, that's actually a really, really good question. And, and, and I'll probably have to pause and think about it a little bit more. But because <laughs> Take your time. Almost, yeah, because well, it's almost like two questions in one, which is... Uh, and, and, and this is going to sound maybe anti, you know, and, and you know, uncharacteristic for flea, but you have to be greedy. Be <laughs> greedy about opportunities. Be greedy about learning. Be greedy about growth. There, I've yet to come across a situation where there wasn't a tool I could learn from, right? Like there wasn't an additional tool I could pick up. Like uh, being in this conversation right now, I'm literally learning from from you, Rick and Jack, about hey, what is it to actually, you know, be able to actually you know, have an interview, have an engaging conversation. That, I'm, 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 I'm trying to actually refine that tool right now, yeah. right? And, and so, you know, I think one of the best things that people can do for themselves, especially if they're actually trying to actually get more tools is learn to say yes more <laughs> um, and learn to embrace embarrassing themselves or whatever, um, just so they can actually, you know, learn and, and do all these other things. Like, like right now, this is being recorded and, and maybe I'm potentially embarrassing myself because I'm showing up wearing dickies. No, right? no, you're doing, can I tell you, this is but, amazing. But, but you know, it, and that, that's kind of like the thing, you know, um, just putting yourself out there. Um, I, I think one of the things that you think about though, with the guards actually potentially, when is that time to actually maybe leave a, a, or move on from a company? You know, a couple of things actually, but yeah, it's like, hey, do I feel like I've capped out? I feel like I'm no longer growing at the company. And that's always one thing to always consider. Um, the other, you know, it's like, hey, do you feel like you're still making an impact? Um, you know, we focus a lot here at Gusto about, hey, what is the impact we're actually making to people's lives, right? Like, hey, what are we actually doing? And, and there are so many ways you can actually make an impact, even if it doesn't feel like you're immediately growing. And, and I am one of those people like, hey, the more you practice something, the more you actually get better at it, et cetera. And, and, and so if you're making an impact, uh, that's a, a definite reason to stay. Um, when you feel like you're not making an impact and you don't see a path towards that, and then yeah, you, you should probably actually think about maybe moving on to, to the next position. Um, the other thing I think deeply about with regards to when to decide to actually stay versus go, et cetera, um, is, is also you know, the values of your company, 
Um, I, I've been really, really fortunate at some of the companies and, and like, you know, one of the things I love about Gusto is that I'm never ashamed of what we do here at Gusto. Um, that's not something that all companies can offer. And that's not something that all people can actually say. And what I mean by that is that I, I know for a fact that if I do my job well, when I go to sleep at night, somebody's life is actually better, right? And, and, and I know that when I wake up in the morning, that if I go to work and I, and I do the best that I can, that somebody's life is going to be better. At no point is an action that I perform um, going to harm someone. And that's, for me, is deeply important. Um, I, I know that other people have different values, but, but for me, that's actually really, really important. And, you know, when you think about those three things, that can often offer you a trigger about when to actually start thinking about looking. It's like, hey, are you no longer growing, right? Are you no longer actually adding to your tool set? Uh, two, hey, are you no longer having an impact? Uh, or what is your impact? It's actually, you know, really, really, you know, really diminished. And then three, are you and the company actually aligned on values, right? Um, and so when you think about those things, that can give you an indication of when to potentially think about, you know, leaving a company. But the other thing is also be be bold and also bet on yourself. And, and what I mean by that is on the bet on yourself, sometimes there's actually opportunities within a company that you literally just have to ask for. Um, and, and that's also another good way to actually extend your career um, is to say like, hey, what else is going on inside of this company that maybe I'd be a good fit for, or even more so, what is something else inside this company that I'm, I'm afraid of, right? Like, I think I might actually, that this will stretch me and I might fail or I might stumble to really actually help push you to that next level, so. You have to be a little brave to do that, right? Because that, that, for a lot of people, what would you say to a lot of people? It's scary, you're, you're a very confident man, I could tell. But for some people, it's, it's scary to go internally and say, you know, let's say Rick is my boss, and I'm kind of looking around, then I'm going to feel maybe I'm disloyal, maybe he's going to fire me. What would you say to people who, who have the talent? And you've probably seen these people, please. They have the talent, but they just, they're not maybe as assertive. What, what, how, how can they manage this? Yeah, so, so like a, a couple of tips for other people. And, 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 and I'm, I'm glad that I'm doing a good job of acting such as you feel that I'm confident and that I'm brave. Um, <laughs> wait, 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 but, okay, okay. are you? You come across that way. Um, but I... You know, it is, it's interesting. Uh, bravery can only be shown in, in, in moments of conflict and moments of fear. So I, I'm a very fearful person, um, but I feel like I've risen to the occasion when it's called for. Um, but for me, that's because I personally believe that I have a, a, a higher responsibility and duty in life to utilize my talents, utilize the, you know, the ethics and morals that my parents instilled in me to actually make the world a better place. And, and so you know, I look at it from that lens and I actually encourage other people to look at it from that lens as well. We think that being brave is something that you're born with or that some people have a certain inclination towards that. Bravery is a muscle and it's something you can practice and it is something you can actually do small steps at a time. And one of the first steps towards bravery are the things you actually tell yourself is the confidence and the chances that you take on yourself by telling yourself like, hey, maybe I am a good fit for this before even having a conversation with your manager is actually making that bet on yourself and talking to yourself, having that conversation and being brave to yourself to actually face your own fears and say like, Hey, well, what would happen if, um, and, and for the people that might be a little bit shy about approaching, you know, their manager or, or like in the gusto case, people in power, or someone who's really there to try to actually help you grow your career um, is to recognize that your leaders want you to grow um, and, and, and they want to take chances on you. And sometimes we don't know until you actually tell us. And, you know, piece of advice that my, my you know, father gave to me was don't say no to yourself first. Let somebody else say no to you. And oftentimes we limit our own careers because we're actually saying no to ourselves. We're saying like, oh, well, hey, you know what? I'm this like silly hacker from Mississippi. I can't help build a product. And, and that's actually a great, you know, and it's easy to fall into that mold or to say like, hey, yeah, you know, like I, you know, I don't have such and such a degree. So, oh, I, I can't go and talk to an accountant or I can't go and talk to the people in finance because I don't have a finance degree or vice versa. Somebody from finance saying, hey, I can't go and talk to engineering because I don't know how to program. Um, that's saying no to yourself. Um, and, and, and more often than not, you're actually wrong, right? 
Um, and, and you'll find this from a lot of leaders that they want to hear those people that want to place bets on themselves, that they actually want to encourage that. And, and so that's one of the things I always recommend is like, hey, just ask for it. Like the worst thing you're going to get is the no that you've already told yourself, right? Because if you're not asking at all, you've already told yourself no. Um, so you don't actually change anything. And a good leader will not penalize you for that. And, and they won't penalize you that for that for looking for other opportunities internally or externally, um, because a good leader wants to see you grow. At, at least for me personally, the things that I'm the proudest about uh, are things that have actually happened for people that no longer work for me, that did move on, that moved on to bigger and better things. The way that we truly build legacy isn't from the money that we collect. It isn't from the various statues that get put up for me. It's actually about the people you've impacted and the people they impact. And it's like this glorious cascading effect and it just explodes exponentially with the guards that you seem like, hey, how can you actually improve the world? And you can improve the world by actually getting all these other people involved and getting them better, setting them up for success, building and growing more great collaborative leaders and humans. And, and yeah, and that's actually part of what also got me excited about Gusto was just the fact that you need to come here and to not only help empower these people to actually grow and become great leaders, but also to help empower some of our customers to set them up so they can actually do that as well. That, that, that's how we fundamentally actually change the world and actually make it a better place. It's not by uh, making money. It's not solely by inventing technology, although technology is a tool. It's about changing and improving people and giving them that access, giving them the tools that they need to actually build their own houses, to build their own platforms, to build their own future and dreams. Wait, can I, Rick, do you see this too? So on your site, and I see this as an executive recruiter, is that oftentimes people leave because they, you know, they have a bad manager, they're not motivated, they're not appreciated. It seems like you were talking a bit about you know, as you as a manager, how, what, what do you do to, to empower your staff? Because you said something that is really meaningful is that you're happy to see these people go and leave and succeed. Whereas a lot of managers, Rick, you've seen, you, you, you kind of deal with it every day. You see these people, not so much. So what do you do? Like what, I don't want to say your secret sauce, but what kind of things do you do for people who are watching this and who are watching what we posted, you know, on social media again, that, you could do to keep, to motivate your people, to appreciate them, to show gratitude and to help them grow and blossom? Yeah, uh, it's, it, it, one, there isn't a one size fits all. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's actually one of the very first things that you recognize, or at least that I try to recognize is something that would engage and inspire Rick may not be the thing that actually engaged and inspires you, Jack. And, and, and so you do have to kind of like lean in to kind of like, you know, that idea of actually just situational leadership. Um, I, I can tell you like some generic things that I actually try to apply. Um, one is actually spending quality time understanding the person that you're dealing with. And, you know, and I've said this before, it might sound cliche, but treating them as a human and a person and not as a resource. That's a, that's right? a revolutionary idea, right? Like, I, I, I know. It, not it, everyone it sounds, does that. Sounds, sounds super crazy, but recognize like, hey, wait a second, this, is, this isn't just... A computer that I'm talking to, this is actually a human, they're <laughs> flesh and blood, they have motivations, dreams, stress, all these other things that actually come along with actually being a person. They're going through similar strife and similar success and similar journeys that I am going through. And so I always try to actually remember that, like lead with empathy. And, and that's actually one of the best things you can do is actually be empathetic towards your people and letting them actually see that. Let them see you fail. Let them see you be vulnerable. Um, like, you know, one of the things I do at Gusto is I share my performance review with everybody, right? And it's so people can actually see like, hey, Flea is just like you. Like, yeah, yeah you might have better fashion sense than Flea, but yeah, you know, <laughs> like there are a lot of things that are still really, really similar. Um, and, and, you know, it, so that's actually one of the things. I think the other thing is actually talk honestly with people about their career and their career aspirations and ask them how you can help them. And, you know, and I've told people like, hey, you know, if there's another company out there you might be a better fit for, let me know. And I will go to bat for you. I will try to help you. Hey, if you're trying to actually launch your own little startup and that's your actual dream, um, yeah, it's like, hey, let me know. Maybe, is there, maybe there's a VC in my network I can help you pitch to and actually get funding from, et cetera. Maybe the best way to actually boil it down is... You can do this by being sincere about investing in your people. And that's either with time, that's with opportunities, that could be with words of encouragement. 
um, that can also be what challenges. Like, you know, there's some people that the best way to actually inspire them and actually get them motivated is to throw the craziest, most insane idea at them. That's actually one of my favorites. And that's how I like to be empowered. I like to say like, hey, Flea, this is the dumbest, craziest, impossible thing. Uh, do you think you and your team can do it? It's like, yes, that's the stuff I, I get excited about. But there are other people like, hey, you know, like I want to do this kind of work. I want to be in this kind of industry. And sometimes people are like, hey, you know what? I want to make a career shift. And, you know, if you are truly being a good leader, you're trying to actually actually build that path for them. Now, now having said that, that's not necessarily possible in, in all cases. Like, you know, I, I have a limit as well. Like, you know, um, I would be a not the best person to help somebody actually get a, you know, life and like, I don't know, law enforcement or the, you know, or, or politics or those kind of things. Um, but there are other things that you can have help with. And that's also using my network to connect them with people that actually can help them with those things. So, so it's really about staying true to actually wanting to invest in your people. Um, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be well received though, right? Like there's always going to people be, you know, people within your remit that are going to leave and there's some, some things you actually just can't change. But I do hope that I can operate with integrity and I can actually continue to operate with my own beliefs and I can continue to actually invest in people um, in the way that other people have invested in me. Because yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't get here why I am as a CISO alone. And I don't know if anybody actually truly makes their journey alone. And I think it's important that we, yeah, I guess to get touchy feeling for a second, I think it's important that we all help each other. And, 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 and that means, yeah, like going out on a limb, making, making bets on people in your network, making bets on people that you are empowering and ma even making bets on your leader, right? Like, like, you know, like what are the things that I can do to also help, you know, the leaders in, in my life that are actually helping me? So. You, you mentioned this title and you call yourself this, you call yourself a people empowerer. Yes. At uh, can, can you like break that down? Like what, what is it about Gusto that, that makes that possible? Yeah, so uh, I, there's so many great things about it. And, and, and one of the things actually I like about the title, People in Power, it's just, it's just a straight up description. And it's not fluff. It's not that stereotypical Silicon Valley fluff and that we're going to change everything around. It's like, no, this is meant to explicitly communicate both to me and the people that I empower what the expectations are. And, and that means helping them be the best performer that they can be and to help them actually grow in the ways that are good for them. Because ultimately, if you take care of your people, they're gonna take care of your company, right? right. Um, and, and they're gonna take care of your customers and your customers will feel that. And that's actually part of the reason why customers love Gusto. It, it, it's because, and it, it, sounds like it, it sounds crazy, but it's still simple. And, and especially for people that are small business owners, they already get this, right? Like, all small business owners know like, hey, if I take care of my people, they're going to take care of my customers. We sometimes actually forget about that here in Silicon Valley. And, and you know, Gusto keeps us really grounded. And so, you know, this idea of actually being a people in power means that I'm not somebody's boss. They're actually, to some extent, they're actually my boss, right? And it's like, hey, how, how do I best service them? How do I best set them up for success? And, you know, what do I do to help them grow? And sometimes that growth might even be something that is uncomfortable for them as well. Um, and it's like, hey, you know, you know, because part of my job is actually try to help recognize and refine the talent that we actually have there. Um, we have a saying in the, the, the security organization here at Gusto that iron sharpens iron. And it's all about making sure that we also try to challenge each other, to push towards growth, right? Because growth isn't always comfortable. Um, growth isn't always easy. Um, but growth is obtainable for everybody. And a good people in power sees that. And, and, and I definitely feel like I would not have done my job well if the people within my remit aren't better off a year later, that they don't have a new set of, of, of tools or the tools they have aren't more refined. Um, you know, like in an ideal world, uh, you know, nobody ever has to work again, you know, because Gusto is doing so great. But, you know, if somebody decides to leave Gusto, I want them to be going out with this badge of honor. Like, whoa, you're from Gusto. You, that means that they immediately know, oh, you are a great technologist. Um, and I explicitly use technologist and not engineer. And there's actually a number of reasons to actually talk about that. Um, it means that, oh, hey, you, you're from Gusto. You are a great communicator. Oh, you're from Gusto. You 
fundamentally understands what it means to love the customer and to make sure that the customer is being served well. Um, oh, you're from Gusto. That means you fundamentally understand what it means to truly be value driven and to actually live your values. Um, so that's what I think of when I think of actually people in power. And, and, and I love it because it's, yeah, like it's right on the 10. That's exactly what it says. And, and, and that's actually one of the, the better things. And it's, it's like I said, it just sets the stage for so many ways about how to operate. And it sets the stage for me when I wake up in the morning, like I immediately know what my job is. I'm a people in power. That's immediately my job. And that's what I'm supposed to wake up to do. That's what I get excited about. That's what actually gets me going. Um, you can probably even see like how animated I get now, even just talking about it, uh, because it is such an important thing. And, 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 and it's the difference between a okay company and I, there's nothing wrong with okay companies. If that's for you, hey, that, that, that's great. Um, but it's the difference between an okay company and, and a phenomenal company. And I would argue that Gusto is a phenomenal company. And it's partially because of that culture. And, and it's because of that focus on people. Uh, it, it, it's like I said, it sounds cliche. It's like, yeah, we're the people platform. Um, and so much of that is actually just hardened into our DNA. Um, and, and it really is about like, hey, how do we actually make people and their lives more enriched? I think Rick mentioned that there's no titles at Gusto. Yep. Is that right? That, 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 is, that is correct. Um, and, and there's so many benefits to that. Now, obviously, there's always trade offs. Um, but one, one of the great benefits is it levels the playing field. Good ideas come from everywhere. Um, you know, like one of the most phenomenal things I've seen, I guess actually a couple of examples, like, oh, we had great features launched by interns. Um, we had great products essentially initiated by people in our customer success organization, where they're like, hey, you know what? Here's something that actually doesn't work well. And you know what? I want to be a product manager. And I'm just actually going to start working on that. And I'm going to actually help you do and, and, and it's because we want everybody. Everybody at Gusto is an owner. And you operate like an owner. Now, if you have hierarchy amongst all of that, if you're saying like, oh, well, you know what? I have to wait until this certain person with the title says X, Y, and Z. Or, oh, I, I can't do this because I don't have that title. Fundamentally, we're not doing what's best for our customers, right? Um, and, 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 you know, the other great thing, and, you know, we have this saying, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, we're, 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 we're titleless, not entitled. And, and not having titles really helps reinforce that. Um, it means that me, as somebody who, you know, is technically a, a, an exec, I have to have a compelling argument, actual data when I'm trying, you know, when I want to help with a decision with an engineer or somebody else. And if that engineer has better data than me and a more compelling argument, that's the argument we actually go with. Right? That is the decision we go with. Um, and, and, you know, it helps raise voices, whereas titles can often dampen voices. Um, you know, we, we do have hierarchy at Gusto because hierarchy helps with just the navigation of a business and actually make, you know, some decisions easier and things like that. But we recognize that good decisions, good leadership comes from every single angle of the business. Um, you know, when we are hiring at Gusto, we actually try to figure out what makes people tick, what makes them excited, what are their values? Because we feel so strongly about this idea that everybody at Gusto is an owner. Everybody at Gusto has potential to be a leader. And if we try to stifle that with titles, then we are at a disadvantage. Um, or, or rather, we, maybe we've actually just found a hack, right? We found a shortcut that maybe some other companies haven't. And so we're able to take advantage and harvest more input, harvest more great ideas, harvest more passion than other companies that stifle that innovation with titles. I mean, so if, walk me through how you assess someone's values in an interview process. You know, say I'm a candidate, I want to work at Gusto, you've inspired me. Like, what, what should I say? What should I do? What should you say? What should you do? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So uh, here's what you should say. And here's what you should do. You should say the truth and you should do what feels right to you. Right. Um, and, and, and those are generally the people that actually perform best at Gusto is those people who really want to actually, sh you know, be, be their full selves. And that's actually one of the things actually I love about being at Gusto. It's like, yeah, I mean, like I said, like, 
I'm not that Silicon Valley guy with uh, the all bird shoes and the like <laughs> the vest or whatever the hell. It's like, yeah, like, dude, like I, I, I dress like an auto mechanic, right? And that's actually what, I, what I'm most comfortable as, right? Like, yeah, like, so, uh, you know, showing up and actually being your being yourself and, and be, being truthful. Um, and, you know, we often just ask people to actually tell us about their lives and, and tell us about situations that they've been in um, and, and how they go about actually making decisions. And, and, and that's a way for us to actually really understand, like, hey, what's actually important to them? And, and you know, what are the values that actually really resonate with them? Uh, you know, because values to some extent are a shorthand for all the things that we haven't written down yet. Um, you know, one of the examples I like to use when I talk to people about values and, and in particular gusto. So, um, you know, I'm a Boy Scout. That's why I maybe mean, I'm, I'm a little bit weird. You know, all Eagle Scouts are weird. Uh, and you know, um, you know, Josh Reeves, our, our, our CEO and co-founder, is also a, a Boy Scout and also an Eagle Scout. And so, with, I, you know, and I, I raise up this analogy just because of talking about like, values in general. So, like, if in the parking lot, if Josh sees some trash in the parking lot, I know that Josh is going to pick it up, and I don't have to actually tell him that because we actually have these shared values. And, and this is so important, especially inside of a startup and especially inside of a tech company, even more so inside of a company that touches and reaches so many lives that we're on the same playing field because we can't write down every scenario. However, we can be aligned on what's important to us and how we actually operate and the values that actually inspire us and actually motivate us such that even when the rules aren't written down, we kind of know that we're all going to make the same decision, right? So, so like at Gusto, I don't have to verify that somebody actually wrote down a rule about, uh, you know, being kind to a customer in distress because we actually have these shared values. We don't have to actually write it down. I mean, obviously we're constantly actually improving on our processes and things like that, but when we actually run into these edge cases and the world throws us edge cases, right? So, you know, for example, when COVID, you know, struck and things like that, there wasn't a playbook for COVID, but we knew because of our values at Gusto, like, hey, you know what? Our customers and all these small businesses are in pain. We're going to do something about it. And we built infrastructure at Gusto to help people, not just our customers, but all small businesses get PPP loans because of the values that we actually have here at Gusto. And that didn't even have to come from the CEO. In fact, that initiative actually came from the bottom up. That was actually just some engineers, some CX people, some product managers like, hey, the world is in need. Gusto, we believe that our mission is actually make work empower your life. We're going to go out here and actually solve this problem without needing to actually being told and it's such a phenomenal scenario to actually have um and, and and that's why we focus so much on values for those people that actually reach out and actually think about those things and actually push forward with that um and and, and i would argue to say that our values are actually part of our secret sauce although it's not a secret like like anybody could actually totally replicate what we actually do here at gusto uh and maybe it takes bravery to do it but i don't even think it's actually being brave uh it's just being yeah, it's just being human and recognizing that we're here to be people. Um, yeah. You know, the idea about having no um, no titles, uh, are there other companies that are like that? Because I'm not familiar if that's the case. I'm you guys know? We're of, of too many. I mean, and, and there probably definitely yeah. are some. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, like, I... I I would never say that Gusto is the center of all great ideas. <laughs> and, and so it's so yeah. like, I'm, I'm positive there are other people that actually latched onto this as well. Um, and think about this, like if you're in a family, does everybody in your family have a title? Like, no, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, there, there might be like a handful. It's like, oh, there's mom yeah. and dad. Yep, you gotta make sure you're really re you know, respectful of them. And you know, like me as a southerner, that means like, oh, you know, all my elders, there is somewhat yeah. of a, a hierarchy yeah. there. But outside of that, and, and not saying that your company has to be like a family, but it does mean that we can actually recognize what actually makes humans work best. And yeah, because yeah. if you don't have titles, to me, it, it, it's when you when you started talking about it, it's so transformative. Because I, I I've worked with with all these Wall Street firms, and it's so hierarchical, you know, where you know up to like they're in the C suites, you know, with the mahogany walls and the big tables and and all that stuff. And for somebody who is lower down, they're not going to dare to kind of bring up an idea or try to raise a question because it's, it's so regimented. 
and it stifles, I think, you know, creativity. It stifles coming up with ideas because you feel, okay, no one's going to listen to me. And the people on the top have that hubris. They have that attitude like, oh, I'm up here. I'm not going to listen to you peons down there. And you got to wonder if maybe other companies didn't have titles and they were more, you know, democratized. How, may, how, how much better would they have been all these years? You know, there's tons of companies. Think about all the companies that have had employees leave and start their own startup. Yeah, which totally could have been incubated Incub inside it, of their own company. Exactly, their own companies exactly, and, and those kind of things. Exactly. And I think one of the things that you know that's great about Gusto is one, yeah, we we don't want big egos here, um, and, and so that actually helps. It's like everybody's like, hey, you know, yeah, it's like somebody who's right out of school, somebody who hasn't even maybe even been to college can have just as good an idea as somebody with a PhD. Um, we also operate under the notion that the world is, or at least has the potential to be an abundant place. And ideas are something that can actually be abundant. And, and when you operate from a stance of scarcity and a stance of, of maybe possessiveness, that stifles innovation. When you operate, especially in, in the world of like ideas and execution, there is a well of abundance there. And, and there's enough great ideas for everybody. And there's enough opportunity for credit and praise and to some extent, even financial rewards for everybody. And, and, and we solidly believe at Gusto that the world can be an abundant place. And, and we can definitely start inside of Gusto with some of that. And, and that is aligned with this whole idea of like, hey, yeah, titles, yeah, I mean, like our general counsel has to have a title because there are legal requirements and say yada, yada, yada. <laughs> but should there be a difference between two engineers? Like, you know, like one engineer, just because they have like 20 years of experience with a PhD, does that necessarily mean that they're going to have intrinsically a better idea than somebody who's just out of school or maybe out of a boot camp or maybe has no programming experience at all? Like I said, we've had so many great um, instances inside of Gusto of great performance, great ideas, and great execution from people that were operating outside of their discipline or operating outside of their background. Like, you know, when you look at my security team, for example, and, and, and like our, you know, my IT team as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I even have to actually think about how many people have quote unquote security degrees. Uh, I do not have a security degree, <laughs> right? And, you know, um, when you think about, you know, just the industry at large, you think about like, hey, you know, who are some of the people that actually are great, you know, developers, like, you know, one of my security engineers, uh, by trade, is a professional writer, mm -hmm. which is a phenomenal skill set that actually brings to security, and she operates with such prowess and, and things like that. Now, another security engineer, yes, he literally has a PhD, he, you know, did all of this work and things like that, but they're both impactful, and, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean that because he has a PhD that he's going to be better at executing and doing certain things that, that she does well and, and, and vice versa. I mean, he's actually a pretty, pretty good writer himself. Um, so, so it's like, it's, it's those kind of things to actually think about. And like I said, we need to win for our customers, right? We have an obligation to do right by our customers because so many small and medium-sized businesses rely and benefit from Gusto I personally feel a personal obligation to make sure that I show up and to make sure that they have as much access and that they can tap into this well of abundance of great ideas and great execution and not having titles is one way to actually make sure we do that. And that means that, hey, yeah, all these great ideas are a potential thing that our small and medium-sized businesses can eventually benefit from. Wow, that that is such a great, <laughs> to end right <laughs> Listen there. I, I gotta tell you flea i, I was not i expected i thought you'd be great but uh when i said at the beginning of the conversation that you're gonna be the best one i rick i i i i, I gonna find it hard to get a better guest coming forward i seriously man i love everything you're saying it's amazing uplifting i just feel better having just heard you talk about everything you put me in a great mood you, you know you inspired me i swear to god and i'm not saying this because you're a guest i'm not saying it because Rick's here and all that. Seriously, you're just like a very uplifting guy, a very positive guy, a very motivated guy. And that's wonderful to hear. And, it, and it's great when people like you, you know, who, who have that attitude succeed. Because, you know, sometimes they say nice guys finish last, but it's just the opposite. You know, it seems the opposite. 
that you're flourishing we, and, and we, you're, you're, you're just a great person. I we love the story. Totally, we totally don't believe that at Gusto. We yeah. definitely believe that people that adhere to good values yeah. will always win. I am so confident yeah. in the success of Gusto. And, and it's because like, I, I, I'm, I, I'm like, at the bottom of the rung, as far as like actually all, all the great and excellent leaders we actually have here at Gusto. And there's so many other people that have so many more exciting stories and so many different approaches and so many great ways to actually learn. Like I'm constantly learning from my peers here at Gusto. You know, like Debbie Ferguson, she, you know, leads up our, our accounting organization as well as our infrastructure organization. Like I, 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 I wish I could like do a PhD just studying under her. Like, you know, you think about like Eddie Kim, our CTO and co-founder. Like all the things he's actually learned about actually starting a business, actually operating, actually scaling a business are all things that, you know, like I, I enjoy learning from. And one of the great things about Gusto is everybody has access to these people. It is just that easy to sign. And it, and it, and it blew me away because like I've had so many people say like, whoa, I, I, I get to just have an office hour with the CISO and talk about whatever. And I'm not even in the security team. It's like, yes. I'm quite like, why wouldn't you? And it's like, hey, you just get to spend time with the CEO. It's like, yes, why wouldn't you? And it's because everybody can benefit. Like, we don't have to have scarcity. We can have abundance. And that's one of the things that also just excites me about Gusto. And yeah, and, 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 it, and it excites me about the people that come and apply to Gusto looking for similar things, actually saying, hey, I want to tackle really hard problems. And I really not only want to change the world, but I want to be proud about how I change the world. It's just such a unique and special thing we have here at Gusto. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I get just as excited. Like I can literally go on for like hours. <laughs> so this is great. Thank you so much yeah. for coming. This, I, I couldn't. Rick, right? I, I don't think we could have asked for a, a better, you know, first run of doing this and, and better guest. Wow, that's that's amazing. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on, Rick. A, any last words? No, just Lee, thank you for your wisdom. Are, are there roles that you're hiring for now at Gusto for your team? Yes, so we are hiring for security engineers. We're hiring for IT engineers. We're hiring for project managers, program managers. We're actually kind of hiring for everything at Gusto. We're just growing extremely rapidly. And, and like I said, we're committed to servicing our customers, which means that we need all of the great people to be here at Gusto. Oh, that, well, that's fabulous. And I think a lot of people would benefit from your wisdom. Uh, so thank you, Flay. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me on.